Sonic Lab TV. Hello, welcome to another Sonic Lab. Today we're looking at the Keith McMillan Instruments Cuneo, which is a very interesting project actually. It started life as a Kickstarter project and they raised an enormous amount of money because everybody seemed to want one. And now it's here. So let's take a look at it. This is it. It's almost exactly the same size as an iPad, very slightly smaller. So it doesn't quite fit in all of the peripherals. It's basically covered in all of these pressure sensitive uh, pads, faders, switches, uh, rotary kind of pads. There's a cross fader here. It's very thin, uh, same thickness as probably an iPad too, I'd say by the looks of things and very light, but it's sort of quite sturdy. It's, it's probably more, it's less flexible than the Keith McMillan 12 step, which I looked at on a previous uh, review. So let's get it on the bench and see what it does. So you just have a micro USB connection here. This is a kind of newish uh, USB format. Uh, you get the same thing on HTC One X phone chargers and also Blackberries, I believe. So you should have the various leads lying around, although it does come with one, so uh, no worries there. And just plug it in, it gets all the power it needs uh, just from that single one connection. So I'm just gonna plug it into my laptop. I've downloaded the software from uh, uh, Keith McMillan. They recommend you do that as soon as you do anything, before you do anything else, update the firmware, etc. So here it is. Um, you can see that what makes it a bit different to most is that all of these uh, pads, every single pad has got a light behind it. And what's interesting really is that these 16 pads, which are kind of laid out MPC style, have four lights, one in each corner. Uh, and that's because each corner of this is actually responsive separately. And it's got a pressure and an XY pad uh, position as well for each one. So you can get an enormous amount of parameters just out of one single pad. Uh, needless to say, you can just turn these into sort of drum pad modes where they, they just respond simply to uh, velocity, pressure, and a single note. So it makes it a bit easier for programming stuff sometimes. And again, you know, we've got uh, this crossfader here, which is slightly higher resolution. And the color, if you see the color behind these, they go green through orange, through red, kind of like VU meters. And in fact, you can set these up to dance uh, to the levels. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but maybe we can see that a bit later. Uh, there's also these buttons here for sort of scrolling through various parameters. And we've got these rotary encoder style pads here as well. All of these pads are uh, touch, velocity and pressure sensitive. So you get a lot of controller data out of this thing. In fact, if I just switch to the editor now, where it's available Mac and PC, you can see just how many parameters there are available. So if I now switch to the editor, which has got this rather charming Darth Vader <laughs> kind of icon, uh, you can see just the level of complexity. I'm going to click on this pad here. Uh, this is the first one of the, the, the drum pad matrix. You can see it's in drum mode and in drum mode I can send a note value, I can send pressure. Uh, pressure can be any number of, uh, any, any one of the 127 controllers. We've got X and Y position can be separate controllers and then they return and we can also switch velocity on. Or if I go into grid mode, each corner has its own note, pressure and velocity setting. So I can touch any of the corners and press any of the corners and effectively I've got four controllers in one pad. Or if I put my finger in the middle and I wiggle like this, I'm getting kind of uh, all sorts of X, Y axis stuff coming out. Same goes for any of these buttons. Any of these buttons basically have channel, note, velocity and pressure. Anything apart from the, the, the main switch. So the faders have got it. Uh, these have all got different bank settings. You've got four banks and also four banks for the rotary encoders. Each of those has uh, pressure, speed, location, pass through width. And then you can set this button here to switch banking between the four banks on the rotaries, the vertical sliders, the long slider. So a massive amount of control there. The one special case, which I quite like, is also this cross fader. It's a slightly higher resolution fader. And as well as position and pressure, it's also got width. So touching it with two objects, and moving like this allows you to send a value based on the width that you select too. That's really neat. Especially good for things like setting the Q and the filter cut off in separate motions. It's sort of quite an intuitive way of working. There's one other little thing that we should quickly look at, particularly on the pads, that we can show and hide advanced. Now, with the advanced setting, you can set the dynamic scale or the curve 
to any number of, uh, well, to these settings. And also you've got the sensitivity you can adjust and the on threshold and the off threshold. So it allows you to get really tweaky so that different pads can respond in different ways. Programming has been made a little bit simpler. Uh, you've got this uh, copy current sensor, paste sensor. So I could take this one here and paste it onto this one here. So all of this is a kind of complicated and you know there's a lot of parameters that you can access here but fortunately Kino does come with a few presets. We're going to take a look at how it's set up in Ableton Live. So now I'm in Ableton Live uh, I've got this blue box which you might be you might see with sort of the launch pad and uh, the APC that kind of thing that just shows you what this grid is currently controlling because this is Ableton Clip launch mode. I can select tracks by these buttons here uh, I can move the blue box across in groups of one track at a time. And then these, each side of uh, th the pads becomes a clip launch. And this final one is the scene. So I can launch the first scene here. Then I've got volume of the first one, first loop. Another loop here. It's got three little loops. And then whatever track I happen to be selected on, this would then be effect send one, effect send two, pan, and volume. So if I just drop down here, you can hear I've got this kind of clip going on, uh, which is, uh, if I go here, this is the CR78. And now I can show you that the, the way the fade is working there, I've got the Q and the position of that. So it's pretty neat. Um, I've also got, if I go to an actual clip, these affect the start and the end point of the clip. It's a bit, uh, it's a little bit tight. I mean, I wouldn't want to be doing it live because it's a, not quite the most accurate way of inputting data, but it just shows you what can be done. So all of this, you know, when you actually run the installer for Cuneo, it asks you whether you want to install templates for various programs. And what this does is write a little controller XML file that uh, Ableton will read and then be able to map these functions and have bi-directional control. So that gives you an idea of just how powerful it can be. I mean, I find it a little bit unintuitive this way, but it just shows you what the power of this thing is. So we just come back to this to show you what's going on in drum pad mode as well. Uh, at the moment, uh, I've got no tracks enabled. This bottom row here enables me to solo or record enable a track. So now if I change patches to patch 10, which is uh, drum rack mode, it allows me to use these as just regular drum pads. And you can see that they can trigger and it's, you know, it feels pretty responsive. The only thing I didn't like about that, it seemed to me that we missed a trick. What would have been great is to set up like a 16 by 16 grid of drum pads that had note values and then maybe use some of these transpose type buttons to be able to transpose the whole lot up and down octaves. Because I for one find uh, Programming drum pads really time consuming and you know wasteful whereas I usually play drums over a keyboard because I've got access to any sound I might want whereas if I've only got 16 aside I might think actually I really need a you know clave or whatever it is and I've got to go in and poke around reassign the note and it just sort of breaks the creative flow. If you had a transpose you could basically page up and down and just continue to record without actually kind of stopping the record process. So I'm not going to set up lots and lots of different ways of using that. That's really down to you and your imagination. And in some ways that's part of the kind of drawback because there are so many possibilities that given a blank canvas and an, an infinite number of possibilities, you could kind of go a bit crazy just thinking, what can I do with this thing? Fortunately, there are a lot of videos from uh, Keith McWilliam showing you how to set it up doing various things uh, and uh, with different pieces of software and what have you. So that's all good. However, I do have a couple of gripes. First one is um, the sensitivity uh, is a little bit difficult to get exactly right, certainly on the rotary pots and the smaller faders. It's quite hard to get really macro. It'd be nice if there was some sort of a shift button so that you could get into sort of uh, really fine mode on some of them. That would probably help for entering certain parameters, certainly for the clip length uh, uh, settings and what have you. But overall, uh, we're talking a pretty amazing bang for the buck. I mean, this is a couple of hundred quid in the UK, other currencies you'll scroll below. And when you consider that uh, some of the other controllers aren't far off that, that Keith McMillan does, 
this gives you a whole load more and all that extra visual feedback really does kind of bring it to life. But you do need to remember a couple of things. You will need to spend a bit of time setting it up to be you know, all it can be for you and it can be a bit of a time black hole. And also um, you do need to make sure you've got it on a firm surface because it doesn't respond as well if it's wobbling around or anything with a bit of uh, give. So do remember that. But generally speaking, Keith McMillan's journey from this kind of Kickstarter project into this final production of the Cuneo has been one of a great success. So now, uh, thanks to that, we have yet another one of Keith McMillan's kind of slightly off the wall, but still extremely useful controllers in the world. And that's a good thing.